Calista Zuma is the director of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Program at the Center for International Development at Harvard University. And he's a senior research associate at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. Uh, he's got a CV that is the envy of everybody. And if I go through it, he will have even less time to talk about. So let me just say that he is a very well known, regarded uh, member of the international community, has received many honors. Recently, he became a member, uh, an international member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, that may not be the highest honor that you have received, but <laughs> at least in a university, it's a high honor. So uh, let me just say that uh, his research interests include evolutionary and systems theory, science and technology policy studies, institutional change, biotechnology, biological diversity, international trade, and international environmental policy, all lifted out of your CV. <laughs> although I knew many of those. Uh, he's currently working on a book on biotechnology and comparative public policy. And he has written widely on issues of science, technology, and environment in newspapers and magazines throughout the world, uh, Asia, Latin America, North America, and Europe. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kalistus Yuma. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the only reason I show up at my own talks is to serve as a backup for PowerPoint. But, <laughs> but at least this one was very well managed, this trip, because I was asked to, to send in my PowerPoint well in advance, which I normally don't do. Um, so, so I was asked uh, to basically introduce the findings of, of this report. I'll just pass this copy around, which is, uh, and give you a bit of a background uh, origins of origins of this report, uh, which is ha predates the so-called Millennium Development uh, Goals. This is uh, has uh, independent origins. My my own background is in the area of science and technology policy studies. I set up a, a think tank in Kenya in, in the late 80s to work on science and technology. It coincided with the preparations for the Rio Conference on environment, so all science and technology issues were essentially taken off the development agenda and replaced by environmental considerations. And there was a view then that uh, 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 technological innovation was one of the sources of uh, ecological destruction. Therefore, if you wanted to protect the environment, you needed to reduce the application of science and technology. This was a very dominant view in, within the UN. In fact, it's very difficult to abolish anything in the United Nations. Uh, there are committees there that work on, created to work on decolonization, even though there are no colonies. These committees, it's been impossible to abolish them. But the UN succeeded in abolishing the UN Center for Science and Technology for Development in, in 1993, which is the only time the UN has ever abolished uh, uh, any, any institution. And I think it's very instructive that it was, it's a science and technology institution, partly because of the lobby of en environmental groups and was replaced. The budget was then diverted and used for the creation of the UN Commission on Sustainable Development. Uh, after that, uh, much of the work on technology policy studies in the various institutions, uh, including universities, basically uh, disappeared. And so in, uh, in 1999, I set out after a conversation with the UN Secretary General, basically to try to bring back this issue on the global agenda. It was almost like a kind of a personal crusade, very self-serving because I'm trained in that field and I didn't want to see my field disappear. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was lucky because the Secretary General, uh, Kofi Annan, is a graduate of MIT, so it was evident to him that you couldn't possibly do significant transformation of the economic fortunes of poor countries without investment in science and technology. So this is the origin of this of this report. Later on, it became part of a larger agenda, which is to advise the Secretary General on all the Millennium Development Goals. And so most of my work has been to basically get the issue of the role of technology in development back on the, on the global agenda. This has been, been the mission. Just to give you can, kind of an indication of the impact of this report, uh, was more than uh, I ever expected. Uh, I thought I could just get together a small group of scholars who 
kind of still wave the flag and keep the idea alive. We sent the draft report uh, that was uh, early last year to all presidents and prime ministers. It was a draft and the idea was just to get their feedback, which you would normally do when preparing a report of this kind. And I was quite surprised to see the kind of correspondence I was getting back, which was like, thank you very much for your report. We've set up, this is coming from presidents and prime ministers. We've set up a committee to implement it. And I said, hold it, it's still a draft. <laughs> we are not even sure ourselves. Uh, Bolivia, the president of Bolivia sent me an email saying, this is excellent report. Uh, we can't do anything about it. We would like to do something, but send it to us in Spanish. Uh, I was not prepared for, prepared for that. This was, uh, this was last year. This was last year. Yes, this is a, that's a different. <laughs> don't, don't distract me. <laughs> I had a kind of a, a, a rude comment about development agencies, which I had deposited in the, in the, in the report without having consulted. I was using my editorial authority, in which I say that donor agencies are either hostile, you know, ignorant, or even hostile towards science and technology. And somebody in the United Kingdom thought that this was an important point to test out. So the House of Commons set up a select committee to test that hypothesis that donor agencies are hostile to science and technology. And they found worse than I had actually expected. And this created a big storm in the UK, uh, which led to the establishment of a position in the British Aid Agency to advise the government on science and technology. It's the first time they have had that, that office. And the hold of the office is the former president of the Rockefeller Foundation. So he brings in considerable expertise and, uh, and experience. Uh, we've had similar offices have been created. Uh, in Canada, for example, the Minister of Foreign Affairs has just created an office uh, of science and technology advice to the, to the ministry, including, of course, the prime minister re-established the Office of Science Advice. The last time they had it was 1966. There are at least 40 countries that we can point to a direct impact of this report uh, at, in terms of structural reorganization of government to incorporate science and technology in overall decision making as a way to place innovation at the center of the development process. This is a, and so, so the main one of the key findings of our report, which is being taken fairly seriously by governments, is that uh, if you want to place science and technology at the center of your development process, you have to realign the, ma the machinery of government around that concept. And it entails, in fact, either creating new structures, operating differently, uh, or in some cases, merging ministries, abolishing, uh, abolishing others. So, so a large part of my time is actually devoted to just managing the consequences of, uh, of this report. Just a little anecdote, in the UK, when they created the Office of Science Advisor to the Department of International Cooperation, the Prime Minister also has a, a Chief Scientific Advisor. And then, uh, expectedly, there was uh, this friction between, the, not the, the persons, but the officers in those offices. So I've been spending a, a bit of my time just kind of mediating between uh, between these groups and trying to figure out how to make the system work to separate between, uh, if you like, f uh, overall normative functions of the Prime Minister's office and the operational ones that are at, that occur at the, at the departmental or ministerial level. Uh, so, so this is uh, the context in which we set this to do this, this work. What I do here is uh, quickly go through the, the challenges that developing countries face, which are fairly familiar to all of you, a sense of the framework that we developed for the report, uh, and essentially policy opportunities that exist for developing countries to move in the direction recommended by the report, and finally, the risks involved in it. Uh, we had to address uh, to address that. The, this is just a, a basic outline of the of, of, the, of the structure of the report. Uh, we, we, we were guided largely by the view that you have a large number of countries uh, that uh, really face significant economic challenges and uh, Africa kind of represents 
that family of countries, but we're using Africa as a metaphor rather than a geographical uh, location that you go into countries, for example, in the United States, you go to Maine and you find conditions in Maine that are identical to conditions in many African countries. So, so I teach a course on Africa and I get uh, students from the various regions of the US and Mexico petitioning to take it to say Africa is what you are describing is similar to is that, does that mean my time is up? This is kind of a diagnostic overview of the context in which we, we are dealing with, which is that many of the countries that we, we were looking at, uh, basically they have uh, exhausted the conventional means uh, of uh, addressing economic problems and this is either they are failing to meet their basic human, human needs, and this is expressed in uh, uh, episodes of famines and other uh, human, human health problems, or they are failing to compete in the global economy, uh, partly because they are not able to add value to their uh, raw material uh, uh, exports fast enough to be players in the global economy, which requires technological uh, innovation. And, and, and thirdly, they are they are basically having serious ecological problems which you cannot address without increased scientific competence, uh, contrary to the, the position of an environmentalist. And there's a, a, a final dimension which I'm not covering here, which has to do with the role of information and governance. And so we basically concluded that uh, they needed to make a transition from dependence on raw materials to a more knowledge-based economy that's driven by, uh, by innovation. Uh, the the timing is particularly interesting because there were uh, most of the science and technology policies we've inherited today f in most developing countries were developed in the pre-globalization era. They predate, uh, for example, the WTO, which is the institutional manifestation of that, of that change. Uh, and it's important to kind of appreciate what constitutes globalization, which uh, in our assessment, at least the way we framed it in the uh, in the report is, uh, is uh, basically focusing on three areas, which is the growing connectivity between uh, countries, individuals, institutions worldwide, uh, enhanced mobility, uh, uh, largely arising from uh, uh, advances in, in transportation technologies and the interdependence <laughs> uh, of economies. These are the, uh, the, the, f the three main features that we, we've identified as constituting globalization. Uh, and there are major features also attributed to that, which include economic liberalization and then the emergence of new institutions that seek to govern the new global economy, of which WTO is just one, but there are numerous others uh, in a very wide range of, of field that, that uh, ad address that question. Uh, and uh, underlying that is a very strong element of uh, technological uh, innovation as a driving force behind globalization. This is, I think, for this group, th this is not, this is self-evident. Uh, what we did for the, for the purposes of our studies to think of the relationships between technology and innovation as falling in three uh, categories. You have a, a phenomenon which is just a generation of new technologies. A large part of this is carried out by the OECD countries. Uh, and this is a large part of the debate on the so-called knowledge divide or global divide uses basically the generation of knowledge as an indicator. Uh, not so much the utilization of knowledge, you get a completely different, uh, different picture. Uh, and then you have the use of that knowledge, which uh, if you would look at how the knowledge is used without, which is independent of the, of the generation of knowledge. And uh, thirdly, uh, the whole area of uh, strategic alliances between enterprises, research institutions, and other groups. So what these are the, basically the three areas we, we focused on uh, in terms of the globalization of, uh, of, of research and development worldwide. The framework that we used was a very simple one, which is to conceive of develop economic de transformation as a learning process, that economies, think of economies as organisms that learn to do things better. Uh, it's, it's a metaphor, but actually there are more fundamental similarities between economies uh, and living systems. I, I, I don't want to go into that now, but essentially 
we adopted a framework of learning as a framework, so to think of economies as ad adaptive entities that acquire new knowledge and, and use them over time. And so in that case, we think of knowledge as the currency of all change. In fact, we define in the report uh, economic transformation in a very simple way, which is the transformation of, goods, of knowledge into goods and services, Sim simply. If you think of it that way, uh, it has far-reaching implications on how you define growth, how you organize your public policy institutions. Uh, and also, it uh, gives you a sense of where the priority should be in terms of governance. Um, this is where you find major differences between knowledge-based economies and economies that rely on, on natural, natural, natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, under that, we, the methodology for this learning process is the, basically the act of continuous improvement. Uh, that those economies, that those countries or regions that place a premium on tradition uh, really will not benefit from, a, uh, fr from the knowledge economy. And the, the driving force behind that is technical competence. Uh, again, you look at the newly industrialized countries, I mean, uh, it's quite clear what they have done in the last 50, 60 years. They shut down the economies and put everybody on high, higher technical education. Not everybody, but a large chunk of the population. And that basically gives them the capacity to uh, absorb and utilize existing technologies. And, and the, the motive force behind that transformation is, uh, is basically the business. So the enterprise is the vehicle through which you transform knowledge into goods and services. Um, this, you still have debates in the international arena about public goods uh, on the role of public institutions. They, they basically miss, uh, miss the point. And finally, we see government as a facilitator uh, of the development process, not necessarily uh, as, a, as a doer. You, c you can imagine this was not, and this was fairly controversial, putting forward the framework of this kind within, uh, within the UN system and having discussions with the with the diplomats. This is, explains why we sent the first draft directly to presidents and prime ministers by bypassing all the diplomats. It would never have gotten anywhere if we tried to have this conversation with the, uh, with the, with the, with the diplomats. What we saw as particularly interesting, and this again goes contrary to much of the policy frameworks adopted by many countries, is, uh, is that the, f the key element in the transformation of the economies of the poor countries is uh, their ability to utilize existing technologies, which is different from investing in research and development. And so the lending that I see UN agencies lend, or the World Bank lending to countries to do basic research and set up so-called centers of excellence, uh, this actually misses the point. Uh, that if you're at the early stages of economic transformation, all the, a large part of the knowledge, technical knowledge you need to develop is already in the public domain, which explains why uh, late comers grow faster than, in the early stages, grow much faster than uh, front runners, because all they need is to build expertise to harvest that knowledge. So, uh, would, so would that be then that governments are investing in, in basic science rather than in, in engineering? Exactly. They are putting money in basic science and research. You have constituencies of scientists who want more money for test tubes rather than saying, how can I use technology that already ex exist, adapt them to local conditions, and create businesses around them. And then when you have exhausted those possibilities, then you need the test tubes. Uh, and, and so that's the framework we are, we are offering. This is not for all countries. This is for the very poor countries. That's the constituency we are uh, we are concerned with. Uh, and so this has led us to the conclusion that the biggest enemy of uh, the use of science and technology in development is actually the scientific community in poor countries that are a very powerful lobby and basically insist on creating centers of excellence so that they can do the same kind of research that their counterparts mm -hmm. are doing in the industrialized countries. Yeah, yeah. So, so for purposes of this task force, just this is an anecdote, I de decided not to include anybody who calls himself a scientist. All the people from a technical background are from the engineering community. And this was deliberate. So the, the International Council of Scientific Unions, which is the, the lobby for the scientific community, has refused, declined to comment on our report because we don't have scientists involved. So uh, these are all... Colleagues, we, we work together a lot. So every two weeks, 
I sent Thomas Roswell in his office in Paris a report, a copy of this report, in which I write, I'm still waiting for your comments. <laughs> <laughs> and at least uh, he has acknowledged once that he has received, a, a, received the, the copy. And of course, the second part is, w with this knowledge, the next most important thing is to transform that knowledge into, uh, I mean, to use it as a basis for enterprise development. Uh, and, and our view is that it's only after you have exhausted the body of knowledge available that it, you, you are put in a position to have to create new knowledge. Now, this may not be, this is a caricature, by the way, it may not be true in certain fields, like in the life sciences. There are some areas where you may have to go to the frontier of knowledge right from the beginning. Uh, but a large part of the knowledge needed to get these economies going, this is the framework that, uh, uh, that we're offering. So it's really an act of of, uh, of, of technological domestication. And then in terms of the, where we thought we would put priorities, and I'm about to, uh, to finish this, the first is to realign the structures of government around science and technology. And the primary recommendation we make is that presidents and prime ministers need to have science and technology advisors. And the reasoning is very simple. If you are, if you are in a mining area, you don't need to update your knowledge every, every day. But if you are dealing with life sciences, you need, before you can make any serious decisions on investment, you need almost a daily update on what the frontiers of knowledge are. Hence, the need to have a, a regular mechanism for science and technology advice. And so raw material exporters don't need really uh, daily reports on science advice. They may need daily reports on fluctuations in prices and markets. Uh, but not in technical advice. But if you are in the knowledge economy, you need that. Secondly, we, we have a strong recommendation on the role of physical infrastructure as a, as a foundation for technological development, not just simply moving goods and services, that a lot of the fundamental skills are developed uh, in the area of, uh, of building and maintaining uh, infrastructure, which is also the link with the engineering, engineering sciences here. And uh, we, we attribute a large part of the poor economic performance of Africa to largely failure of uh, investment in infrastructure. There are all sorts of reasons why that's the case. And thirdly, we focus on uh, higher technical education. Uh, this happens to be uh, an interesting area where uh, donors have consistently said poor countries need to invest only in primary education and not in uh, higher education. And they, it's not that they don't fund it, but they also serve as a role model. So I've served as a pre a chancellor of the University of Guyana as an honorific position. But uh, I had my own deans telling me, don't put to government a proposal to increase the budget of supporting the university because the World Bank will cut off other funding. This is my own deans fighting against their own self-interest. This just to give you an indication of how entrenched this, uh, this thinking uh, is. So we have a, most of my work at the moment is really organized around how you use institutions of higher learning as a vehicle for community transformation. And I, I can talk a bit more about that. Uh, and, and finally, the area of, of a business development. Here we are concerned mostly with business incubation uh, rather than just the traditional partnerships between enterprises in the north and the south or the area of foreign direct investment. We, uh, we discuss specifically uh, business incubation. Uh, what I'll do now is I'll, I'll get to the to the issue of risks. The, the issue of the risk risk discussion came up uh, because I took this matter to the World Bank. Everybody told me don't make recommendations on infrastructure, on higher education, and on business creation because those three areas are not really supported heavily by international organizations, which were also the core of our recommendations. So we really uh, had no option but to engage with these institutions directly. And I'll be, I was part of a, a round table with a, that included the managing director of the World Bank, the president of the U.S. Academy of Sciences, uh, the science advisor to the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, and was convened by the science advisor to then Colin Powell. And it was just basically discussing the issue of how to get higher education to the center of, of development. And everybody was saying it's high risk. It takes too long to show results. Uh, and, and so we basically uh, had to confront the issue of risks. And essentially, it became uh, this summarizes what 
everybody told me. I mean, every time I show this to colleagues of mine, uh, particularly from the legal profession, they quickly point out how stupid this act is. Uh, and they tell me that it really this zebra ought not to be taking any risks of this kind. At the very least, it should have a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been told that. And, uh, and I, I use this as a caricature because you have to know why that zebra is on the run. <laughs> And so my position on this is that the risks of inaction, which is not investing in the area of scientific and technological innovation as a foundation for development, by far outweighs the risks of doing something. Uh, and in fact, doing nothing, uh, this is what I, we tell developing countries, that doing nothing is it's in itself, in fact, uh, an act of risk taking, but a negative risk taking. Uh, so, 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 and I think this is the message that has really been getting through to leaders worldwide to a point where a large part of our time, my time now is devoted to two things. One is helping particularly the industrialized countries that want to change the character of aid uh, so that aid can be directed at building competence in the poor countries rather than delivering services. And secondly, to prepare the, the developing countries themselves to actually accept that aid could be structured differently because they are so used to relief that they are, they are concerned about having to take on major fundamental political problems like reforming universities and bringing them to the service of uh, community development. They don't want to do that, they prefer to rely on old models. So my work is focusing just on those, uh, on the, on those two areas. So I think I will stop here and I'm sure you have questions. Thank you.